Greetings folks, Professor Fiore here. In this video, we are going to take a look at the relationship between the upper break frequency of an amplifier, the F2, also defined as the half power point or the minus 3 dB point. We've looked at that in other videos. Its relationship to the rise time that we would get from throwing a square wave into the same amplifier. There is a definite relationship between these two things. Rise time and the upper break frequency, you can think of this as sort of two different manifest manifestations or two different views of the same phenomenon, right? Think of it as like uh, a thing in a room, some like statue or something, and you're looking at that through two different windows. So you see something a little bit different, but it's the same thing, right? It's the same phenomenon. So the views give you different information on the view itself, but they're reflecting the same effect, right? The same kind of thing in this case. So you can determine the upper break frequency if you know what the rise time is, right? This is an alternate way of, of determining the upper break frequency. If you have a single clearly dominant lag network, which would be the case in your average run of the mill uh, op amp circuit, then the F2 can be found as 0.35 divided by the rise time. The rise time in turn is defined as the amount of time it takes for the signal to swing from 10% of its peak to peak value up to 90% of its peak to peak value. And you can do this, we typically do this on the, on the waveform's leading edge, but you could also do it on the falling edge, in which case we call it the, the fall time instead of the rise time. But um, in the kind of amplifiers that we're using, those things would be the same number, all right? So you could do it either way, but typically we do it on the rise time. Um, two little caveats here. The most important one is this assumes there is no slew limiting at the output of the amplifier. That's a serious issue. You, you know, if you see this sort of straight line that you get from slewing, forget about doing a rise time measurement. All right, that's going to completely mess up your rise time measurement. So with particularly slow op amps, you know, low slew rate op amps, that can be a, a serious issue, okay? Uh, the other thing is no clipping, right? Obviously, if you're going to distort the waveform through clipping, then mm, this is going to go by the wayside. And you might be saying, well, how can, I, you know, how can I clip a square wave, right? It's already clipped on the top. Well, trust me, you can, right? It'll just distort, and you'll see, it'll just distort what this wave shape is. Now, if you think about for a second, the uh, RC charge discharge curves that you would have seen in an AC uh, circuit analysis course, right? We have a single resistor and a capacitor and you see these you know, exponentially related charge and discharge curves. Essentially those same curves are what you see on the leading and trailing edges of your square wave. Because having you know, a, uh, a system that's zero volts in, and then you put in the first cycle of the square wave, right? The very first half cycle, that's like turning a switch on. You, you're applying a potential. So you see that same kind of thing. You see that same kind of charge on the capacitor. You see the same sort of waveforms across capacitor resistor. Now, in our case, it's, you know, it's the lag network, so we're looking across capacitor. Well, we know that the RC values, right, from the AC circuit analysis, set how quickly this thing charges. Right? You know, we talk about, uh, you know, five tau, right, to get to steady state. Well, we don't really care about steady state here. What we care about is, uh, you know, this rise time, this 10 to 90% thing. But, right, these things are related. So that same value of R and C we know is what sets the critical frequency, you know, the 1 over 2 pi RC calculation that we do. So these things must be interrelated. The, the proof of this equation, the proof of this 0.35 over T rise equaling F2, you will find in the associated op amps text. Uh, remember, you can download that for free on my websites. The links and so forth are in the description of this video. And if you really want, you can get very inexpensive print copies uh, as well. Right? So just follow the links there. All right, so let's go look at a circuit. 
So I've got a nice little 741 sitting over here, right? That's a one megahertz device. This is a, a series parallel non-inverting amplifier. Gain is RF over RI plus one. So we got 9K over 1K plus one is 10. You know, I like to use simple numbers you can calculate in your head. So the signal gain and the noise gain here are the same. They're both 10. So the F2 we would expect, you know, based on gain bandwidth product would be the one megahertz divided by the gain of 10 or 100 kilohertz, right? So if you think about that for a sec, um, if I take that equation, right, the 0.35 over rise time is F2, and I solve it in terms of uh, rise time, then we're, we would be looking at somewhere around a three and a half microsecond rise time. All right, so I'm gonna kind of echo here in Tina what you would be doing in lab, you know, using a, a, a digital scope, obviously, right? So the first thing is we have to come up with an appropriate signal an appropriate input signal, obviously a square wave. I want to make sure it does not clip. So I've got 15 volt power supplies, so I can easily get, you know, a 10 volt peak swing, but I don't want to get up that high. There's no reason to get up that high. Rise time is not a function of how large the signal is. Whether it's a one volt output or a five volt output or a hundred millivolt output, as long as, like I said, we're not getting clipping, as long as we're not getting slewing, the rise time will be the same. It right? doesn't matter how big that signal is. I just want to use something that's convenient. In the lab, you want to get something that's big enough so you don't have a lot of you know, noise issue, right? You don't have a lot of fuzz in your waveform, okay? So I'm going to use 100 millivolts peak, gain of 10. That's going to give me a 1 volt peak or a 2 volt peak-to-peak -peak output signal. And you would like to use a frequency that is slower than your expected break frequency. So we're expecting something around... You know, like I said, an F2 of about 100 kilohertz. So I'm throwing in 10 kilohertz. You could do something higher. You could do 20, 30, 40 kilohertz. Um, when you get to much lower frequencies, if you're going to throw in like one kilohertz, it's kind of difficult to see the leading edge. So, you know, you can zoom in, but then you're probably going to start losing resolution in the time domain. So, um, you know, maybe a 10 to 1 or a 5 to 1 would be good. I'm just going to stick with... Um, you know, 10 to 1 here, just because it's, you know, again, a nice round number. All right, so we're just going to do a transient analysis on this and see what we get. Okay, so 1 millisecond to 1.2 at 10 kilohertz will give us a couple of cycles. Boom. All right, so our um, input signal is the green, right? Here's the VN, nice little square wave, 100 millivolts peak. So each one of these little hash marks is 100 millivolts. And our load is the maroon color. And you can see we're getting roughly this one volt peak. There's, it looks like there's a little bit of DC offset, but nothing to really concern ourselves with. So we can see there's definitely a bit of pokiness here in the rise or in the fall, however you want to look at it. Um, and it would be symmetrical. Okay. So to measure this accurately, I'm going to zoom in on this, right? just like you would on your scope. Okay, you take this area and, you know, zoom into that. Now you can see that, you know, that RC kind of rise effect, like I said, that you would have, you would have seen in your AC circuit analysis course. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of probes out here, excuse me, a couple of cursors, and move those around to the various points. So again, 10% to 90% of the peak-to-peak -peak value. So the peak-to-peak -peak value on this is 2 volts, so 10% of that would be 0.2 volts. So I want to come up 0.2 volts from the bottom here, and I want to come down 0.2 volts from the top. All right. So the bottom down here is, you know, just about minus one volt, right? It's 992 roughly. Okay. You can see, I'll move that over here to the middle. So, you know, we're, we're going to be looking at, you know, somewhere around minus 0.8, you know, whatever um, our resolution allows, right? So maybe somewhere right around there. Okay, well, yeah, I, I guess that's pretty close. Get a second cursor out here. And now we're going to be, um, you know, looking at uh, two tenths down. So, you know, about 0.8. All right, so yeah, that looks pretty close. And now I just want to read the differential. All right, what is the time differential between these two things? Well, it's three, this is reading out 3.4158 microseconds. So if we take that a little over 3.4 microseconds, okay, we divide that into 0.35, 
guess what? We get just about 100 kilohertz, just a little bit off, which is exactly what we expect from the 741, right? We said it's a one megahertz device, gain of 10. So should be sitting right around 100 kilohertz. That looks great. All right. Very, very happy with that. Okay. So where do we go from here? Let's just clean this up a little bit. All right. So, um, you know, let's change the gain, see what happens. Okay. You know, if this is all true, we should see an appropriate effect. All right, so same circuit, except I've thrown in a 99K for RF. So this will give us a gain of 100. Now I'm going to compensate by putting in a smaller input, right? So I've got 10 millivolts peak now, gain of 100. So that's still going to give us a one volt peak output, right? Two volts peak to peak. But, you know, the higher gain is going to drop down the F2 value, right? So the gain bandwidth product, again, one megahertz divided by now a gain, a noise gain of uh, 100. Is going to give us an F2 of about 10 kilohertz. Again, I'm going to want to use a lower frequency, right? Because if you use a higher frequency, you're maybe not going to get the entire uh, waveform. And I'll show you that in just a sec. But let's, you know, before we do that, you know, because it's good to see what the errors are, right? Um, let's just check this out and make sure that uh, this equation is in fact predicting appropriately. All right, so since this is uh, 10 times lower of an F2, I would actually expect a 10 times slower, or 10 times larger value for uh, the, the uh, rise time. Okay, so I'm going to run from 1 to 3, so that's 2 milliseconds. That should give us a couple of uh, cycles at 1 kilohertz. Boom. All right, so that looks, you know, superficially a lot like the first one we had, except obviously the, um, the input signal is a lot smaller. The DC offset that we're seeing is a bit bigger. Okay, you know, we can deal with that. I am, once again, I am going to zoom in so I can get a closer look at um, that rise, right? So there's that same basic shape we saw last time. Let's grab a couple of cursors. So let's come down here. You know, where are we? We're sitting at about, you know, it says uh, minus, minus 919, almost 920 uh, millivolts. So I want to go again, um, 0.2 volts off of that because we have a two volt peak to peak signal, right? You can see that this has been pushed positive, right? So, you know, it's been pushed positive by about a, a tenth of a volt. If I come up here, you know, there's, again, it's pushed positive by about a tenth of a volt. So it's still about a two volt peak to peak. So I have to go up two tenths from this minimum value, all right? So, you know, we can actually go by these little hash marks on the side. So it's got to be up somewhere around here uh, that's too big of a jump well okay well, it's not going to be perfect but you know close enough for our purposes so same thing over here i have to pull this down about two tenths okay so maybe somewhere around you know 0.9 ish okay somewhere in this vicinity probably about there and we're getting 35 microseconds. So again, 0.35 divided by rise time of 35 microseconds. You divide that out and you're going to get just about 10 kilohertz. All right. Beautiful. Formula's working out great, right? Okay. So like I said, what happens if you use an incorrect frequency over here? You know, so let's say that um, I'm going to come in and I'm going to change this. I'm going to keep the amplitude, but let's, you know, let's bring this up to something like maybe 10, 10 kilohertz, you know, the expected frequency that we had. What do we get now? Okay, so I'm going to uh, do another transient analysis, and you're going to see the, the issue. So I'm going to, because we're going up to 10 kilohertz here, we can uh, shrink the display a little bit. Ugh, look at that. See, there really isn't enough time. Notice this thing is not at 2 volts peak to peak anymore, right? This doesn't have enough time to fully go up and flatten out. So you're not going to get an accurate value, right? You know, to, uh, to make this a little bit more obvious, like, you know, let's put in, I don't know, like maybe 50 kilohertz, okay? Something that's way too high. And do an analysis. Uh, I'll 
just bring this down to 1.1. We'll get a whole bunch of cycles. Look, it's like turned almost into a triangle wave, right? There's, you can see there's a little bit of curvature in here. This is not a wave you can measure a, um, a rise time on, right? Because it's not hitting the, the, the min value up to the max value. So, you know, you could calculate 10% and 90%, but you're, you're actually looking at maybe, you know, 30% to 70% or something crazy like that. And that's just not going to give you a proper value, right? So that's something to consider. You know, if you see a wave like this or more like a triangle wave, you know you need a lower input frequency. There has to be enough time for this thing to actually flatten out. Right? In other words, you need something like this. So it doesn't have to have this long of a time. You, know, you could use, like I said, twice this frequency. Right? We originally had one kilohertz. You could, you could throw in you know, a couple of kilohertz, and that would be fine. It's not like you have to use you know, the factor of 10 that I used. Let's speed that up a little bit. Uh, let's just go to 1.5. Okay, so, you know, there's enough time there for the thing to flatten out. This is actually pretty nice. You know, you can see the edge um, without even really zooming in, all right? But that's what you need. You need this wave to come up and pretty much hit that flat spot, whether that hits it here or here or here. Just make sure you have some flat on the top and the bottom so that you actually have a square wave, you know, an actual square wave. You don't want to see something that, like I said, looks like this because you can't measure a rise time on this. All right. And like I said at the very beginning, make sure that uh, you don't have a slew limiting problem. Now, the, and that's really kind of obvious. Um, you know, I'll look at this one. You'll know you have slew slewing because it'll kind of come up. It'll be a nice straight line up to here and then it'll suddenly break or right? it won't be a smooth curve through here. OK. Uh, typically, that's a problem when you have, like I said, uh, you know, low slew rate op amps. A lot of modern op amps, unless you're putting in really big signals, um, it's not really going to be a, a huge issue. The slewing is going to occur right here in the fast areas, you know, like here. Okay. All right. So you got an alternate way of determining your F2. Now, there is an interesting little twist to this. It turns out that square waves can also give you insight, not into just the high frequency performance of an amplifier, but they can also give you insight into the low frequency performance of an amplifier. And we'll look at that in another exciting video. Stay tuned.